Well, it is a privilege to get to be with you this morning and praise our great God, even in the midst of weather that still seems like it's March. Um, so it's apt that what our topic is today. Um, so I want to let you know this, this uh, series that we're in is, is called Say What? It's been dealing with difficult questions with the Christian faith. And uh, Ben and Terry are out of town right now, and they've tasked me with, you know, one of the easy ones. Um, we'll see if that's the case. Uh, before we get going, I, I want to let you know who my intended audience is. You know who you are, but I want to let you know I'm, I'm addressing this primarily to, to Christians because I believe that unless God does a work in your life to change your mind, change your mind rationally about, about God, there's not a whole lot that I could say to convince you about God's existence or his goodness in your life. So I'm addressing this primarily to Christians, mainly just because I, I don't want to be up here just trying to win an argument. That's really not what I want to be about as I stand here. Um, so here's our question. If God is all good and all powerful, then why do people suffer? So imagine yourself at your favorite restaurant or coffee shop and somebody walks up and asks you this question. And hopefully, by the end of our time, you'll have some kind of answer. It might not be the best answer, but it's one, and I hope it's encouraging to you. So here's, here's where we're headed with this, and here's what I want this message to do for you. If you don't believe in God, I want you to know the Christians care deeply about you and the suffering that you are experiencing or have experienced in your life. If you don't believe in God, I want you to know what the content of the Christian hope is that we can have in the midst of our suffering. And then if you're a Christian, I want you today to be encouraged as we unpack what our hope is in the midst of our suffering. So that's the question. If God is all good and all powerful, then why do people suffer? So Christians, how should we respond. I mean, normally we start thinking, okay, there's, there's this reason, there's this reason, okay, you know, okay, and we're, we're getting, you know, we're thinking, okay, what did I learn in, in Bible class that one time, in Sunday school a long time ago, what, what's the answer? But I don't think that should be our, our go-to when it comes to this question. I think our go-to should be something a little bit more related to this. This is Lee Strobel, the author of, of The Case for Christ. He was asked this question once. If God is all good and all powerful, then why do people suffer? This is, this is him telling this story about his exchange with someone. He says, the email was snarky, with decidedly hostile and mocking undertones. At the end, the person, someone I didn't even know, posed a pointed question. If your God is loving, why does he allow so much pain and suffering in the world? So I wasn't in a good mood when I read this email, so part of me wanted to answer in a similarly negative style. But I quickly realized that wouldn't be the right approach. So I started to write a detailed five-point answer to the pain and suffering question. I paused. I deleted what I had written. Instead, I simply typed, of all the questions in the universe, why do you ask me that question? I hit send. The answer came the next day. This second email had a totally different tone. The anger was gone and the writer was much more sincere. He described his impressive academic achievements and how he had climbed to success in his career only to lose his eyesight and health to diabetes. His job evaporated, his friends drifted away, now he was living on welfare and food stamps. He was suffering from depression, loneliness, bitterness, and fear. My heart went out to him. As for him, he responded that he had felt heard and valued. See, too often when we're asked this question, our go-to is, what's the right answer? I want to win this argument. I want to convince this person. And if, if that's our primary focus when that question is asked us, what I think that does is it shows the person sitting across from us that we value being right and winning arguments more than we value them, their story, and their pain. Jesus did not say that the world would know that he has come to save by our ability to win arguments. He said that the world would know by our love. So last week we were on a youth retreat at Covenant Pines, and on the last night of the retreat, um, the youth decided that they wanted to play night games. And I just want you to take these two words and put them together and think, is this a good idea? Covenant Pines is the name of the place. Night games. 
But I'm like, you know, whatever. I'm, you know, young, fledgling youth pastor, and, you know, we'll make mistakes as we go. So go ahead and let them. And uh, sure enough, one of them, Andrew Johnson, ended up horizontal at one point, not on the ground. He hit the ground, landed on a soft spot, spot his knee, so on a rock. Um, so he's laying there, a lot of pain. We get the first responders there, all that kind of stuff, and we take him to the hospital. I get to go with uh, Andrew, his sister Abby, and uh, Kim Kringen, so that was a blast. I mean, Kim Kringen is hilarious, so there was, it was, I think Andrew, by the end of that, was hurting in his abs from laughing more than his knee. Um, but when we got there, you know what the nurse asked him? She did not ask him, what on earth were you doing running around in the middle of the night? Isn't that kind of stupid? <laughs> no, she asked things like, what happened? On a scale of one to 10, how much does it hurt? Where does it hurt? She did not get defensive when he came in, like as if he was the enemy of health, right? So when we're asked questions like this, we should respond with questions ourselves. Why, why do you ask? Because most likely the person coming has a story behind this question. If God is all good and all powerful, really the question is, why do I suffer? People are not convinced about the truth of a loving God until after they have truly experienced God's love through his people. So we ask questions, and we dive in lovingly into this conversation. But if that nurse had talked to Andrew and asked all these questions and was really nice, and then at the end said, you know what, Andrew? I don't know what's wrong with your knee. I'm just going to sit here and, and, and cry with you. That's really not helpful. She probably shouldn't have this job then, right? So it's not enough for us to say, well, why do you ask? Let's, let's draw us into a conversation here about your pain, because I, I want to care about you. I want you to know that I care about you. If we don't offer an answer, we're not doing our job. So we have to respond lovingly with an answer. So simplest answer to this question of why we suffer is we suffer because we live in a world that's broken by sin. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden... They enslave the human race to sin and all that sin produces, which includes suffering. So we could just leave this conversation right here. We, we could say, well, we suffer because sin is in the world, it's broken. But I, again, I think if we stop there, we haven't fully loved this person and, and done our job. So, I mean, after all, we could still ask the question, well, why do I have to suffer? Couldn't God just exempt me from the suffering why am I suffering right now? So I want to get at, I think, what the root issue is, I think, of why people ask this question of why suffering. I think within the question of if God is all good and all powerful, then why do people suffer? I think this question is asked in search of meaning. So moms... Um, whether you're, you're pregnant or you're about to pop the baby out, there's, there's this process of pain, right? My wife is, is pregnant right now, and she had first trimester where we learned very quickly we should have smoothies in the morning because that's easier to throw up than toasted bagels. Um, <laughs> so, so there's this process of childbirth, and then you get to the moment, and then I've heard that that is extremely painful I actually, when I was young, I asked my mom, just in total fear, do, do boys have babies? Because I was like, <laughs> I don't want to go through this. So um, really glad it, God is gracious, because I wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, but this is a very painful process. And when you get to the end of that process, and there's a new life, I don't think any of our moms ever said, well, that was pointless. <laughs> or, or maybe you've served in the military or know somebody that's served in the military or, or has served our country through the police force or fire department, something like that, and, and, and they've undergone suffering, or maybe you know someone who's um, given their lives for the sake of, of this country, for the freedoms that we have. We, what we don't say 
We don't say at the funeral, well, that death was pointless. That suffering was pointless. Because in the case of childbirth and giving your life for your country, we see what the suffering has accomplished. And then we have meaning. So what we need to do when people ask us this question, if God is all good and all powerful, then why do people suffer? We need to provide them meaning in their suffering. We have to show them that their pain is not pointless. So now we have to ask the question, what's the point? Why do people suffer? And again, I'm addressing this to Christians. So I want to show you in three different ways what pain, what suffering has accomplished in the Christian life. In three different ways, what pain and suffering has accomplished for the Christian in the past, what pain and suffering accomplishes for the Christian in the present right now, and then what pain and suffering will accomplish for the Christian in the future. So first, what pain and suffering has accomplished for the Christian in the past. So I believe that even before Adam and Eve ate the fruit, that God's plan was that the greatest sin committed by mankind and the greatest suffering endured by humans. So those two things, greatest sin committed by mankind and greatest suffering endured by a human, that those two things would meet and the greatest accomplishment would be done in the history of the universe. And those two things, where that meets, greatest human sin, greatest human suffering is the cross. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, his death and suffering for the sake of sinners. And what Christ accomplished for us on the cross is that Jesus died to rescue you from the greatest suffering imaginable, eternal suffering, away from the presence of God in hell. So I could not stand in front of you and say that Christians care about all human suffering down to the smallest paper cut and neglect to warn you about the greatest suffering possible and offer you the way out. We, we have to be full Christians, whole Christians here. We cannot just try to make a difference as a church, Northridge, by providing people their material needs and neglect to tell them about what's coming. We have to get there with people. Because this is our case. Your greatest problem is not that you have experienced suffering in the past or experiencing suffering in the present, even though those sufferings are really real and we as Christians should never diminish them one ounce. That's not your greatest problem. Your greatest problem is that you are a million time felon and you have committed your felonies against an infinitely valuable, holy, just, eternal God. And Jesus, through great suffering, has purchased for us rescue from the wrath of God. Instead of the longest lasting greatest suffering imaginable for us because of Jesus' suffering, we have opened to us the longest, lasting, greatest pleasure in the presence of God. That's the exchange. So just plead with you, if this is not you, if you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ today, I want to know that your suffering is cared about here, but I also want you to know that this, this is really important. There is a greater suffering coming if you do not put your trust in Jesus. It's open for you. It's, it's free. He wants you to come. He loves you. But just don't miss this offer today of salvation accomplished for you on the cross. And if you are trusting in Christ today for your salvation from the wrath of God, and you've experienced peace with God through this sacrifice, know that God has used the greatest suffering imaginable on the cross to purchase for you your happiness and satisfaction through a personal relationship with God forever. Jesus said, whoever comes to me shall not hunger, whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So first, what God has accomplished in the past through suffering is that he has used suffering to accomplish for the Christian. Jesus, through suffering, has accomplished for us freedom from the wrath of God and joy in God forever. So that's the past. And now the present. Now this is 
probably one of the most difficult parts of this message, dealing with your suffering in the present. And, and I, I can't even begin for some of you to, to relate to your suffering. I would just, if I was talking to you, just probably weep because some of you are going through cancer. Some of you are going through the loss of a loved one. Some of you are going through a miscarriage. Some of you are going through loneliness and depression. And, and these are just so real. And if, if that's you, if that's what you're going through, I just want to encourage you, talk to somebody, please, so we can walk with you, weep with you through this process. Doug Whitliff is our care pastor. He's great with this kind of stuff. And, I mean, I'm inept, but I'll, I'll do my best. But now, what is suffering accomplishing for you, Christian, today? This is, this is what James, the half-brother of Jesus, said about suffering. Unless you think that he's, he's just like a really old first century guy that wears cool robes and doesn't have anything to do with suffering ever. This guy gave his life for the sake of his faith in, in Christ. He was stoned to death. So he's familiar with suffering. And this is what he says in James 1. Count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So what James is saying about suffering is that our various sufferings test our faith and produce steadfastness. In other words, suffering trains God's people. When we're given the option to trust God in the midst of our pain or to run away from God in the midst of our pain, because those are our two options. You only have two options when suffering and pain meet you. Trust God, lean into him, or walk away, run away from God. Blame him. When you're given those two options, when pain meets you, and we choose to trust God, what you've successfully done is worked out the muscle of faith. And if you've ever worked out, you know that lifting weights is painful if you're going to get anywhere. So through our suffering, we have this opportunity to work out the muscle of faith over and over again to trust God's promise that he is still good in the midst of our pain, that he is still 100, don't miss this, 100% for you in Christ, not 99%. Some of you are just beating yourselves up because you think that God is 99% for you in Christ and you've got to get that 1%. That's not the case. God is 100% for you in Christ. The pain is not punishment. He is 100% for you in Christ. And he is working through your suffering to conform you to the image of Christ we have to trust his promise that in the midst of this, he will meet all of our needs in the midst of our suffering. If we trust God in those ways, in the midst of our pain, we become stronger in our faith. We become more conformed to the image of Christ. Unless you think that you lose your individuality when you become more conformed to the image of Christ, that's not the case. You become more you than you've ever been. So now maybe you hear that, that, that your pain is, is working for you, this process of working out your faith, growing stronger in your faith, steadfast in your faith, becoming more like Jesus, and that just freaks you out. Like, you, you're not helped by that message. You, you're afraid. Maybe you're afraid that when that moment comes, that pain comes, that you won't be able to endure the workout. You'll, you'll be bench pressing, and then you'll just let go, and you know where it goes. So... You're, you're afraid that you won't be able to endure. You're afraid that rather than trusting God, you'll sin against God by not trusting him. So if that's you, know that when Jesus died on the cross, he also purchased for you exactly what you need in the moment of pain and is ready to give it to you when you need it. And if you're afraid that you're going to sin against God by not trusting in him in the moment of pain, know that Jesus Christ on the cross has already bought your forgiveness if that happens for you. So whether you're, you're afraid that you won't be able to endure or that you'll sin against God, know that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, you can't lose. 
This is what Paul says about our situation. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So be encouraged. Know that God is faithful and he will bring you through all of your pain and you will guaranteed grow closer to God, not farther away from him. He is powerful and he will not let his children go. So in the present, God will use your present suffering to bring you closer to him, to grow your faith and to make you look more like Jesus. So that's past and present, and now we have a future. So what is it the Christian suffering will produce for us in a future? The suffering that we endure in this life as a Christian is now currently producing for us an eternal reward of glory and happiness in the presence of our God. This is what Paul says earlier in Romans 8. The Spirit himself... So the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. So follow his logic here. So if we are children of God, then that means that we get all of the benefits of what it is to be his children, which includes an inheritance. Then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Then he says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us. So notice what he says is that the condition of getting that inheritance in the family of God is based on our suffering with Christ. So what that means is that our present suffering is already producing for us that inheritance that we would gain on the last day. And then this is, this is where I get really excited. And Paul says this, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So picture some scales. Um, this is like those balancing scales. You don't really see them anymore unless you're seeing like Lady Justice at the front of a courtroom and then we have a different conversation of why you're seeing that so often. Um, but imagine those balancing scales and on the one side of the scale is glory and the other side of the scale is suffering, your suffering. And what Paul is saying here is if you put those two things on the scales, glory is going to drop like, like 10 tons of gold are on this scale. And when that drops, your suffering is going to fly up and barely stay on the scales. It's like dust on the scales. The glory that is to be revealed to you far outweighs your present suffering. And what I don't want you to hear is that the hope of glory should just minimize your present suffering. If, if you've heard people believing that and they're trying to comfort you in the midst of your suffering, that, the vi- advice sounds kind of like this. Glory's coming. It's going to far outweigh your present sufferings, so your sufferings aren't really that big of a deal. Suck it up. Get through it. That's not helpful. Don't say that to people. 
That's not what he's saying. Your, the hope of glory does not minimize your present suffering. What he is saying is that your present suffering is intended to maximize your expectation of glory. This is what this advice says. This kind of advice is embodied by the person who sits down and weeps with you in the midst of your suffering and says, I know that it's so real. But as, as real as you feel this suffering, you will feel eternal reward and glory. It's so much better. So I'll give you an example of what this is, is like. So over the last four years, I've been studying at Bethlehem College and Seminary, and after around 40,000 pages read, and that was the track that had the least amount of reading, 50 papers written, two dead languages studied, thousands and thousands of hours spent researching, thinking hard, losing sleep, asking for grace from my wife and her graciously giving it to me, driving back and forth from the cities, God gave me the grace to graduate on Friday night. <laughs> and you know what's, what's funny is that at my school they have a policy of refraining uh, uh, from applause when, when the, the person walks, so I, I'm glad that I got it right away this time, but um, <laughs> so that's their policy during the ceremony when someone walks, don't clap. They're the people that, you know, let out a woo anyway, my mom. Um, <laughs> so we're walking, and we're all sitting there. We're waiting for this last person to walk. That person walks, comes down, and the president comes up to the pulpit, and he gives the go-ahead to, to applaud. And in a room that felt like it was just packed with over 1,000 people, 50 graduates, roughly, got a standing ovation from the crowd. And in that moment, I did not feel like that present moment of glory minimized my suffering over the past four years. In fact, that suffering maximized that moment of glory. That four years of suffering produced for me that moment of glory. I'll tell you what, it wasn't worth comparing. And I can't wait for the day when we graduate together as a church from this life. And we get to be led in procession before the holy throne of our gracious God. And he will hand out not diplomas, but crowns of glory intended for us before the foundation of the world and eternal happiness purchased for us by the blood of the Lamb. We will not receive a standing ovation from just a crowd of people in a building. We will receive a standing ovation from all of creation, angels, trees, birds, all of it. I'm going to say, I think it's going to be worth it. I think we'll look back on our suffering and say, this was more than worth it. So God has given us the point of pain in these three things. In the past, Jesus' suffering accomplished for us freedom from the wrath of God and joy in God forever. In the present, God is using our suffering to bring us closer to him, to grow in our faith, to make us look more like Jesus. And in the future, God will reward us with an eternal reward of glory and happiness in the presence of God. And it's this last peace, this glorious future that we look forward to in the midst of our pain, when in Revelation it says the dwelling place of God will be with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor the problem of pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And God, seated on his throne, will say, Behold, 
I am making all things new. I can't wait to see you. We are going to be so happy on that day. It's going to be glorious. I hope that it's this future hope that fuels your resolve in the midst of your suffering today and tomorrow and the next week. It's like we just we don't get done with suffering until we're dead. But I hope that it's this future that you look forward to that gives you resolve in the midst of your suffering. So in your program, there's a tear-off. And it says, what are some ways that you can grow closer to God in the midst of your suffering? It's a pretty open-ended question. What are some specific ways you can do that in your life? I can think of three. Maybe it's that you've not dealt with that first part in your life, what God has accomplished for you in the past through his suffering. Maybe you have not ever trusted in that sacrifice for your sake. Maybe that's you. You need to do that today. You need to trust in Christ for salvation. Maybe in your present right now, in your two options, trust God or run away from him, you've been choosing option two, running away from God, and that needs to change. You need to trust that God is still good in the midst of your suffering, even though it might not make a whole lot of sense in the moment, that he's still good, that he's still 100% for you, that he's working good in your life. And maybe you need to look at your future hope a little bit more. Maybe you're not really believing that Jesus is 100% for you, maybe 99%, and you're not totally sure of that guarantee that you'll make it on that day. And if that's you, I just encourage you, trust that God is still 100% for you in the midst of your pain. So let's pray. Father, thank you that you have worked so much for us through pain and suffering. Thank you for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for our sins so that a happy future is guaranteed us and a power and strength in the midst of our present sufferings is guaranteed us. Thank you that you've given us this gift. Thank you that we have a hope. If we did not have a hope, we would not be able to endure our present sufferings. So we thank you that you've guaranteed all who trust in you for salvation, a glorious future that makes this present suffering worth it. So we pray that you would encourage us this week, encourage us as we worship, knowing that you are good and that your promises never So as you go this week and into the rest of your life, know that God is faithful to bring you through to the end. Go with this. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling in the midst of your pain or in the pain that's coming, to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen amen Amen. go in peace